Let's cast some runes and talk about Eldar strategy in Warhammer 40k with an overview of the craft worlds in the current game. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Eldar and I thought it was high time for an overview of the faction seeing as quite a lot has changed since the Codex first came out. In the video we'll talk about their current power in Warhammer 40k and their strengths and weaknesses, go over their core faction rules and some of the strongest aspects of their various different rule sections, talk through top craft world choices, each one of the units in the Codex at the moment, touch on allies and Inari briefly and finish up with a few different competitive army lists. Absolutely loads to talk about so let's jump straight into it. So Craftworld Eldar had basically been on the back burner for most of 9th edition until their codex came out in early February alongside a bunch of cool new kits. At the time perhaps their release was overshadowed a little bit by just how strong things like Tau and Harlequins were at the time, but following some fairly hefty nerfs to those factions it kind of became apparent that Craftworlds were pretty top tier as well. Since then though Games Workshop did rein in their power a fair bit, a few choice rules nerfs to things like Eldritch Storm and Fire and Fade, plus small points increases on just about every key unit. Currently I'd say they're still holding their own though, they're currently holding a win rate of around about 47% in tournament games in Nephilim, fairly solid as a mid-tier army there, they're played fairly often in tournaments, a solid 4 or 5% of armies chosen in the game, very much part of the competitive scene, and they have had 4 GT wins in Nephilim as well, all of which were with Inari interestingly enough, though plenty of other craft worlds have done pretty well with decent podium placings for a bunch of others. Overall I'd rate them as an army that maybe does just a little bit better in the hands of someone who really knows the faction inside out, they may be just a little bit harder to play than some. I'd say their overall faction strengths are a massively powerful psychic phase with linchpin farseers and warlocks commanding the war hosts. They're of course very fast and can hit the enemy well from a long way away. Their units typically do hit pretty hard particularly with buffs and then often as not they have really quite a lot of move shoot move tricks and everything from fire and fade, battle focus to swooping hawks jumping on and off the board so often they'll be able to hit you and then not get hit back. I think their primary weakness though is just about the entire codex is generally very easy to kill, even the tough stuff like wraiths and things isn't spectacular in terms of durability. A lot of the time once the units have dealt their damage a bit of small arms fire can absolutely ruin them, meaning that if you just go for a full on frontal assault you're just going to get destroyed and you need to make clever use of terrain. The troops choices maybe feel like a particularly weak section out of the codex, rangers are usable though not exactly particularly sturdy frontline troops and again they suffer with the same durability issues as the rest of the codex. Just in general I would say that quite a lot of units are just a bit borderline following Games Workshop's nerfs to the faction. Quite a few units are in the usable but not particularly outstanding section I'd say. Still though not all bad, can be a nightmare to deal with in the right hands and they can bring a whole lot of powerful and sneaky tricks to the table. Getting into the actual rules of the Eldar then, for their core rules perhaps one of the most stand out is battle focus. This one applies to most infantry and jet bikes and even a few vehicles if you give them an upgrade. It allows you to do one of two things either advance and shoot with pistols or assault weapons for no penalty, quite nice for getting you moving around the board very quickly, or interestingly it gives you a move shoot move d6 inches, though with a few restrictions like if you go through area terrain you've got to subtract 3 inches and you can't use it if you came from reserves, fell back or want to charge. It can allow ranged units to sort of peek around the edge of cover and then hide, often that's quite achievable to move shoot hide even if you don't directly pass through the area terrain. If it works it really can be quite powerful, a lot of the time though it might not be quite enough to save you from retribution. Otherwise in the codex we've got shuriken weapons, sixes to wound cause AP to improve by two, so basically small arms that can punch up against tough stuff, it means that they're particularly nasty with the doom spell giving you more chance for sixes or that hail of doom craft world. Aspects and phoenix lords have their own unique special rules, aspect warriors get a 5 plus inball save and a 2 wound exarch that can take powers to put them up to 3 wounds, they also get their own mini relics and things which can be quite useful for a few of them, and the phoenix lords can lead their aspects into battle, they can't lose any more than 3 wounds in a phase, get a 4 plus inball and have an aura to make their own aspect obsec as well as themselves. Quite cool to see them a bit more usable again, particularly Mr Baroth. Otherwise for a couple more common datasheet things, Wraith units throughout the book get minus 1 damage these days, makes them a bit more tanky particularly against damage 2 weapons, though I still wouldn't say that they're enormously outstanding per their point, and Strands of Fate is the pure army special rule which I thought deserved a slide of its own. So Strands of Fate I think is really quite a fun and well designed mechanic, I feel like someone at Games Workshop decided to try and make you feel like a farseer who's casting your runes and selecting the ones that will be most helpful to guide your army to victory. 
It's the pure craft world special rule, so you don't get this if you ally with Drukari or something. But you can still get it, even if you have Harlequins on the list, if they use that travelling players formation. The way it works is that you get to roll 66 and then retain the number of dice that are listed in the table to the right. For bigger games you get to keep more, say for Strike Force at 2000 points you get to keep 4. Then as per the further table, for each number that you've rolled you get to basically convert a dice to an automatic 6 when you roll it. And they can be as follows, an advanced charge, psychic test, hit roll, wound roll or saving throw. More 6s in 40k are generally a good thing and 4 of them across the turn really aren't bad. It can just be plugged in for a little bit of extra damage to hit and wound, but I feel like some of the other uses might be a bit better. I think they're particularly relevant on sniper rifles to start with, as they guarantee you a mortal wound on something. can be very nice if you just need to finish off one enemy unit and you have some rangers about. If there are one wound remaining, you can basically guarantee that it goes. I think it's pretty nice if you have a key psychic power to get off and the opponent has deny. It could make that one power just a little bit hard to stop. It can get you some very long charges, and particularly could be interesting for things like Howling Banshees with advances. They have advance and charge, so you could use one dice for the advance and one dice for the charge, and basically guarantee that they dance halfway across the board in a single turn. Automatic saves are pretty nice, of course, particularly nice if you have a big important hit going through, presuming you have an inball save or the AP isn't too high. I do quite like the way that there's lots of different ways that you could use them, and it pairs well with Farseers as well, as you can re-roll less desired results if you have Farseers present. Going through the different rule sections of the codex next, and I thought we'd start with things like character upgrades, warlord traits and relics. I would say that most of the Eldar warlord traits and relics I'd say aren't enormously stand out, perhaps not the most interesting sections of the codex when put next to say the psychic powers for example, but perhaps for the warlord traits Seer of the Shifting Vector is usually a good idea if you can fit it in. That one allows you to farm command points on sixes for both your and your opponent's stratagems, so it's hard to go too far wrong with probably a couple of extra command points over the course of the game. Ambush of Blades is a fairly interesting one for Inari in particular, who really like to be in melee. It grants extra AP to a unit, and that can be pretty interesting on things like Harlequin troops, which don't usually get that. Otherwise, Mark of the Incomparable Hunter is a setup I've seen quite a few times with the Kurnos' bow in the Hail of Doomcraft world. That one gives you a little bit of extra shooting with extra mortal wounds on sixes, and plus one strength to ranged attacks. Otherwise, both the Beotan and Ulthway traits are particularly interesting, and we'll get to those later. Relics wise there's a bunch for the individual aspect shrines which we'll talk about in a second but maybe one of the most interesting might be Fulcher's Wing. That one gives you a 12 inch move, fly and mortal wounds for moving over your opponent. Basically rather than paying for a jet bike for extra movement you could just pay 1 CP for this, get some mortal wounds thrown in and still count as being infantry. Kurnis's bow is that relic shuriken pistol, strength 5 with 3 shots and does 1 mortal wound each time you wound the enemy. It can pair pretty nicely with that incomparable Hunter, and can actually genuinely be quite threatening on a close range Farseer with Smite and Executioner. It means that you're probably putting out at least 2d3 mortal wounds from those, and then if you stack that with a few mortal wounds out of this pistol as well, it's going to be fairly easy to solo small squads. It's particularly good in the Hail of Doom one. Otherwise, for an interesting objective thing, the Sunstorm bike is kind of cool. It's a relic jet bike that gets your objective secured and a massive 20 inch move, could be kind of fun for an Autark with a laser lance maybe as a melee threat, but even just having the potential of it on something like a Farseer or Warlock is kind of nice for objectives if you need it. Otherwise out of the craft world, notably Beotan Spirit Stones and the Ulthway Ghost Helm are also pretty decent. Moving on to perhaps the best bits of the Codex are the Eldar Psychic Powers. In general the vast majority of competitive lists at the moment start with one or two Farseers, plus one or two warlocks. Unlike many other factions, there's easily enough good psychic powers to justify multiple casters. The runes of fate are perhaps the primary one for the Farseers, and just about the entire discipline is pretty awesome here. Guide gets you to re-roll hit rolls on core or character units. That one's great on just about anything to be honest, and it's particularly nice for things with Hail of Doom where you want those sixes. Doom allows you to re-roll wound rolls for core or character units against this one doomed unit. That's pretty spectacular for Eldar in general as well. A whole load of their attacks come in low strength packages. Things like Howling Banshees or Dire Avengers will really thank you for this. Fortune gives you a 5 plus feel no pain type save. Generally that's a very solid defensive boost. Can be good for things like Wraith Guard or Wraith Lords if you're running them. Could be pretty fun on the Avatar of Cain as well to add an extra layer of toughness. Executioner is a nice mortal wound damage dealer. D3 mortal wounds and if you slay a model and it's an extra D3 more. Pretty nice for clearing out squads. 
And finally, last but not least, Will of Azian is a really helpful objective one. It gives a unit obsec and it allows them to shoot while doing actions. Things like fast moving wind rider jet bikes will love the obsec and dire avengers might well like both bits. Then we're not quite done as we also have the runes of fortune. The farseer, spirit seers or corsairs can take those. It's very hard to go wrong with fateful divergence. Cast a power to gain a command point. Fairly easy to scrub them up all game long. And ghost walk is a pretty interesting buff for a plus two to charge as well. That's good in general to further increase the threat range of things like howling banshees but can be pretty awesome for things coming out of reserve as well, giving you a better than 50-50 chance, and you can always CP re-roll it to get more. Then there's the Warlock powers, really quite cheap to get in your army, as they're quite cheap psychers to begin with. I'd say out of any of them, Protect and Jinx is probably the best, either a plus one to saves while the enemy is far away, or a minus one to their saves if they get close. Spectacularly good value for as little as 40 points potentially. Otherwise, Quicken and Restrain, I think, is the other good one. Double moving Eldar units around the board are quite nice, even if you can't do damage after, and it can interfere with enemy movement with something big as well, potentially. I'd say those are the two that normally get the nod the most, but pretty much all the rest of them are usable as well, I think. Not too bad for buffing melee or granting light cover or something. Definitely worth packing in a bunch of psychers. It's pretty good to have most of this list on the board, I think. Stratagems next, and the Eldar have their fair amount of sneaky tricks to spend the extra ones that you can rustle up with that spell. A reactive minus one to hit from lightning fast reactions is often going to be worth it, particularly if it's the difference between a unit living or dying or getting to strike back in melee for example. There's a couple of options that can let you manipulate battle focus a bit, one to allow you to re-roll it and one to allow you to ignore the terrain penalty for rangers, and if battle focus can't be trusted then you can potentially use fire and fade for 2 CP, which can also affect other things like vehicles. That one basically lets you do an unrestricted move, shoot, move, so guarantees that you can keep an important unit safe, but it is only once per game now. There's good psychic manipulation as well, 1 CP for a Farseer to cast another spell, and 1 CP to cast while you're doing an action, say some psychic interrogation or something. Could be handy if you need another buff to go out, or if it's worth the CP to throw out another smite. You can pay CP to put units in webway strike reserve, 1 CP for 1 and 3 CP for 2, so usually one is a lot more efficient. That can be a pretty decent way of delivering things like Dire Avengers or Fire Dragons perhaps, and making sure that they get the strike on the enemy rather than the other way around. Phantasm for 2 CP allows you to redeploy 3 units at the start of the game, or potentially put them in strategic reserve if that makes more sense. Might be worth having the CP for that available at the start of a game. You get to do it after you know who's going first and who's going second, so it means that you could position your units that were previously safe into alpha strike positions, maybe to deal some critical damage straight away. Lastly, for just a bunch of the more usable generic ones that don't apply to specific units, we've got Feigned Retreat, 1 or 2 CP to fall back and shoot and or charge. Always nice to know that Eldar with a bunch of firepower aren't going to be tied up in combat, and they can just fall back and happily blaze away if you've got a CP spare. As it goes, I'd say that these ones are pretty generally strong. Quite a few nice tricks for making sure that the opponent is fighting on your terms and not on theirs. Secondary is next, and for the Eldar and Nephilim, I feel like Games Workshop have actually managed to balance these far better than most factions. Often they just seem to be one or two that are taken all the time, and a couple that are never taken ever. But it does appear that at least all of these get used semi-regularly in tournament games at least. For perhaps the most reliable ones to score some points quite well, Hidden Path and Scout the Enemy are quite good. Hidden Path is a battlefield supremacy one where you have to try and hold a midfield webway gate or objective marker and then it's a sort of defend objective where in your command phase you get victory points as per the battle round so it gets more as the game goes on. It is quite nice that you can nominate the objective or use a webway gate in the point you, that you think you'd be strongest on the board I guess and it's probably going to be stronger if you think that you've got a good chance of tabling the opponent or you think there won't be many of them left at the end of the game. Scout the enemy is a shadow ops one that one you do actions outside of your deployment zone for 2 victory points, and it goes up to 4 victory points if you can do it in your opponent's deployment zone. Potentially it could be done by any unit that can jump around and hide a bit, maybe things like Swooping Hawks will be in with a shot, but ideally it might be good to have a go with Rangers in the first few turns, as they can complete it at the end of your turn rather than having to wait a turn and get shot. If you can keep a unit of Rangers safe in the midfield for most of the game though, then that'll be 10 victory points, which isn't bad at all, Never mind if you get into the opponent's deployment zone. Otherwise, Wrath of Cain I think is okay if you're running a bunch of Aspect Warriors, and they're really not too bad at the moment. For that one, you need to kill enemy units both at range and in melee, one victory point for each, and if you manage to do both in a turn, then you get a bonus two victory points on top of that. Maybe a bit of a middling one, likely to happen as you go around doing what you do anyway. 
Perhaps particularly strong though if the enemy's got lots of small units and you're using things like Dire Avengers backed up with Howling Banshees or Scorpions. Finally, Sky Futures is a psychic action one, not bad at all when you have lots of psychers on the board. See us go around the board doing psychic actions on objectives and getting 3 victory points for each. Pretty easy to achieve when you've got a jet bike mounted Farseer or Warlock, but I do feel that in a lot of games you might just be better off with mental interrogation and going after enemy characters provided they have a few. Still though, I feel that all of them are pretty solid options, and you definitely can build for them a little bit, say taking Webway Gates, Rangers or Aspect Warriors respectively. Next up we have the choice of Craft World. And for top tournament lists, it appears that the strongest three that are taken most regularly are Inari, Ulthway and Hail of Doom, and next after that tend to be Beotan and other Crosstum craft worlds. As mentioned earlier, it does seem to be the Inari that are leading the way for the Eldar at the moment. They've got easily the highest tournament win rate out of the different factions. Rules-wise, they kind of function as a craft world that allows you to soup in Harlequins and Drakari a little bit easier. Though that by itself does mean that you're not really playing quite as pure craft world Eldar as you might have been otherwise, there's often a fairly heavy emphasis on Harlequin units in them. As more of their own thing, I'll cover them with the Allies section later. Besides them though, the other two most commonly played appear to be Ulthway and Hail of Doom. Ulthway is really not hard to see why they attract so many players, basically every single part of their craft world is strong. The craft world trait just mildly buffs just about every unit in your army by a bit. You get a single wound reroll each time you attack, more reliable psychic casts, imbulls army wide on a 6 plus, and mortal wound protection on a 5 plus. Pretty crazy having a 4 part army buff, and all of them good. Then you gain access to Aldrad Ulthran, kind of a farcier but better, who casts 3 powers and reliably. The Fate Reader Warlord trait is nice, you get to retain an extra strands of Fate dice. The Ghost Helm of Alishazia is pretty reasonable to pick up as well. It allows you to know an extra fortune power and casts of a 9 plus are undeniable. And even their stratagem is good with a 1 CP plus 1 to hit from Guardians. It means that they can do a fairly savage Guardian Defender Strike out of the webway. Or it could be useful on things like Windrider Jet Bikes or those support weapon platforms with D cannons. All around a strong faction that adds a bit of damage and really plays into good psychers, which is what the Eldar do best in the first place. Hail of Doom is also really interesting. That one's the Super Shuriken one where hit rolls of a 6 automatically translate into a wound roll of a 6, and then an extra 2 AP on the shuriken weapons as a result. Games Workshop nerfed this one kind of recently so that you can't combine it with another custom craft world trait, but it still seems to be popular enough though, and then the game becomes how many shurikens can you put in the list, between things like dire avengers, shuriken cannons on the various vehicles and jet bikes, and perhaps the farseer with the Kurnus' bow setup. Fishing for those sixes pairs amazingly with Guide as well, as it gives you more chances of those sixes to hit, and translating into sixes to wound. Otherwise, Beal Tan I think is still solid enough, probably the next best out of the main big craft worlds. They get better battle focus, and a single hit reroll each time they attack, and their warlord trait natural leader is very nice, with chapter master four rerolls on one single core unit. It means that you could basically have that and Guide going on for a lot of reroll hits. Their Spirit Stones Relic is really good for a Farseer as well, giving you a free reroll at a failed Psychic Power each turn. That will make the cast more reliable or save your CP. The other custom Craft World traits are pretty good as well. Masterful Shots gives you Ignore Cover, and Swift Strikes gives you extra mobility, allowing you to always counter stationary even if you're advanced, and still be able to fire things like heavy weapons. I think Children of Prophecy is a pretty reasonable one as well. That one allows you to reroll any Psychic Test dice of a 1 or 2, so if you're running loads of psychers, then again, that could give you a lot more reliability casting. Unfortunately, while they have their merits, most of the other craft worlds just aren't really taken very much competitively. Ianding gives you an okay durability boost with extra saves against AP-1 and AP-2, plus the Citronome can help out with Wraith Blades. Same Han allows you to re-roll charges and fall back and charge as well, though the fall back and charge can be done for a CP for any craft world, making it a bit less unique. They can set up a fighty Autark with their character buffs, and perhaps the most interesting thing about them is an advance and charge stratagem for one CP. You could have things like Shining Spears really rocketing from one deployment zone to the next with this, and then still charging. A late talk gives you light or dense cover, a late night spear, and an ability to redeploy rangers with a warboard trait. Okay boosts, but far off the power of Ulthway or even Beotan I'd say. And the minor craft word Altansar also got some rules in a white dwarf at one point. That one's got a fun relic to allow you to manipulate the strands of fate dice, plus a mortal wound protection stratagem, and two command point for pop-up obsec. Still though, I'd say probably not quite enough to be particularly exciting. 
Overall, I'd say for competitive Eldar at the moment, if you want to go with traditional Eldar, it's probably Oldway as your best bet. If you want to make combat Eldar work, it's probably Inari and mix in some Harlequins. And if you just want to go mental on high damage Shuriken Death and Alpha Strikes, then Hail of Doom is still a thing that works well. Moving on to units next, I thought we'd start out with the Aspect Warriors, perhaps beyond Psychers, the most exciting thing about the Codex, and a lot of them can work well and be very powerful in their own different ways. These top ones are my favourite five, all of which are very competitive. Swooping Hawks can bound on and off the board with good movement, chip away at light infantry potentially all game long if they can keep hidden, and out of choices for them, the Hawks Talon is pretty solid on the Exarch. The Phoenix Plume is quite a nice Exarch relic, 5 plus feel no pains are good, and Winged Evasion can give you a minus 1 to hit as well, so they can be just a little bit more tanky than you might expect for 4 plus save infantry. Quite a nice utility and annoyance unit there. Howling Banshees, a super fast melee with high AP and a plus 1 to wound, amongst a whole bunch of other combat benefits. They get to advance and charge, so can use the Strands of Fate automatic 6s quite well for that, and get a really long charge threat range. A common setup is to use Mirror Swords and Piercing Strikes, that gives you an Exarch with an awful lot of attacks and all that damage too. Otherwise, Crone Scream and Piercing Shriek is an interesting combo. It can give you a bunch of pretty much automatic mortal wounds when you charge. Dire Avengers are the premier shuriken damage dealers. A whole hail of shuriken shots out of them and all the AP minus two. They really love the hail of Doomcraft world and just generic Farseer buffs like Doom or Jinx. They do volume fire very, very well and Doom will make the low strength not a particularly big problem. For war gear, I'd basically always take the extra catapult on the Exarch. They can have an upgrade to give their objective secured and if you've taken a casualty on the unit, then there's a two CP stratagem to shoot again which could be pretty potent if you don't take too many. Shredding Fire is an also interesting but powerful one, that can give you Shuriken Rule on a 5+, plus rather than a 4, and it's also very scary. Striking Scorpions get to forward deploy and hit hard with a bunch of mortal wounds from their Manda Blasters. Perhaps the most common thing to use with them is the Biting Blade on the Exarch with crushing blows to auto wound with it. Probably the single best value that you can get out of the unit, that one. And finally Shining Spears are maybe a bit of a premium price tag, but they are ridiculously fast have very strong damage both with the Shuriken Catapults and Laser Lance at range, and of course in melee with a bunch of high AP damage 2 hits. Lots of their upgrades are good to be honest, the Paragon Saber, Heart Strike, Expert Lancers and Kane's Lance are all very usable. Otherwise on the Aspect Warrior list there's also Warp Spiders which I think are solid, mid strength fire and a fair few ways to escape. The Spider's Bite Relic is okay, and Surprise Assault and Web of Deceit are both fine. I'd probably rate them a little bit lower than the top ones, but not by much. Fire Dragons basically do their one job well, with some dedicated anti-tank fire. They do need a delivery mechanism to get there though, with their Savage D6 plus 2 damage melter weapons. Either a CP to put them in the webway, or jump out of a Falcon deep striking on turn 1. Otherwise, I'd say that even the two that I've saved till last are usable, though just not particularly standout. Crimson Hunters do put out some quality fire, though they do have a price tag to go with it, and Dark Reapers have had a bit of a calm down since the previous codex. Okay, generalist fire, but being limited to a smaller unit didn't really help with them, and to shoot they generally need to return fire unless you're shelling out for fire and fade. I'd say out of any of them, these are probably the most overshadowed of the Aspect Warriors, and could probably do with a bit of a buff. Otherwise, for the rest of the infantry in the codex, out of the troops choices, Rangers are by far the most common competitive troops pick, they're the cheapest troops in arguably quite a weak section, and they bring some nice things to the table with forward deployment, a bit of sniping with some mortal wounds that could work with strands of fate dice, and they're quite good for doing early game actions, whether you're using the unique Eldar one or raising banners. I'd rate the Guardian Defenders next potentially. Overall in terms of damage, I'd say they're inferior to Dire Avengers, but still okay. They have a 4 plus armor save and can spam out a bunch of shuriken fire, but you do have to get a full unit of 10 of them, so as a entry level troops choice they're not that cheap. Storm Guardians are a bit cheaper than them, but honestly I'd usually upgrade for the Shuriken Catapult. I feel like their melee damage is just super underwhelming, and I feel like Games Workshop should have made them a little bit more threatening in combat. Finally there's Corsair Void Reavers, a bit pricey but get auto wounding shuriken shots. They can't fill mandatory slots though, so they aren't going to help out filling patrols or battalions, maybe one of the main things that Eldar need most. Moving on to other infantry besides aspects and troops, the Corsair Void Guard in the Elite section, and it may be a kind of interesting Power Sword unit, though a bit inferior to Howling Banshees for the melee role. Could be an interesting unit to camp objectives and just use that fateful divergence power each turn, farming up some CP. 
Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades, I think, generally want to be used as a big stacked up unit that receives multiple buffs, like, say, Fortune. I think they're fairly even in power, to be honest, either close range shooting that packs a big punch, or volume attacks in melee and an invul save from their shields. They get minus one damage. It is quite nice to have a tanky unit for the Eldar. But again, I would say that these guys are just a bit overcosted at the moment. If they were to go down 5 points each, then I think they'd be really quite interesting. Finally, for Jet Bites, besides the Shining Spears, we have the Wind Riders and the Shroud Runners. Both of those are solid enough. The Wind Riders have fast moving shurikens, and you can either use them a bit more aggressively and cheaply with just the shuriken catapults. Or if you decide to shell out for the more expensive shuriken cannons, it can be an interesting choice for using battle focus with and just peeping around the edge of terrain, then hiding. Shroud Runners are the Ranger Jet Bikes with their Scatter Laser and Sniper Rifle. It can do some anti-infantry damage, though I think the main reason that you take those is more for their utility. A pre-game move means that they can be doing disruptive charges turn 1 if you want them to. And as Eldar units go, if they do manage to get cover, they can be fairly tanky. In light cover, their camo cloaks can give them a 2 plus save. I wouldn't take more than one or two small units though, they aren't going to be carrying the main list in terms of damage. Out of all these choices of non-aspect warrior infantry and jet bikes, I would say my favourite here are the rangers and the wind riders. Plenty of the rest I'd say is usable, but just on a fairly niche basis. Grav tanks, big jet bikes and vehicles next. And maybe out of the various vehicle keyworded units in the codex, perhaps some of my favourites are the wave serpent, support weapons, vipers, falcons, webway gates and fire prisms. Wave Serpents are a pretty premier transport, fairly tough with their Serpent Shield, and can be a way to get Howling Banshees, Scorpions, or Dire Avengers to the front without taking too much fire, plus they can chip in with a bit of their heavy weapons themselves. The Support Weapons are a fairly common competitive include, the D-Cannons do seem by far the best for them, enormous damage D6 plus 2 shooting that can ignore line of sight, the chance for some mortal wounds, and they're perhaps one of the few weapons that don't care too much about Games Workshop's barrage nerf. They just have the raw power to still be very scary, even hitting on fours. Very nice in Ulthway as well, with that Guardian stratagem, plus the single B-roll per unit. I do quite like Viper Jet Bikes as well. Really quite fast and expendable, and puts out some shuriken fire. As Eldar units go as well, it is fairly tough for the cost, if you just give it basic weapons. If you need something to zip to an outlying objective, and deal a bit of damage, and then lightly get shot in return, then it's not a bad choice. The Falcon Grav Tank is quite a powerful option. It does pay a small premium to Alpha Strike, but it gets some really cool Cloud Strike Drop Pod style rules, dropping down out of the atmosphere, disgorging likely some Aspect Warriors of some sort, and then they can go to town on the enemy, whether it's Dire Avengers, Fire Dragons, or even something melee. The Pulse Laser is nice and dangerous as well, and it also packs another couple of heavy weapons. The Webway Gate's quite an interesting choice if you know that you're playing on a battlefield where the fortification rules aren't going to get in the way of deploying it. It reduces the cost of strategic reserve, and units that you have put in reserve can turn up next to it, potentially giving you a very threatening way to get dangerous units right into the middle of the board. Quite nice if you can put it kind of close to an objective. It basically gives you a bit of a strong point, and if you take that secondary objective, then you can hold that strong point and be rewarded for it in victory points. Lastly, the Fire Prism is a bit of a big investment one. Often best to take these in pairs and keep them hidden, then you can use the stratagem to allow them to link fire, and give you some enormous damage shots that punch straight through in ball saves. They can make quite good use of the once per game battle focus rule as well, meaning that you could just nose one of them with the linked fire just out of terrain, zap something with it, and then use battle focus to hide it nice and safe. The whole thing might just be a bit higher investment against some armies, but against some of foes then it's really going to make a big difference. Imperial Knights for example are not going to like seeing a pair of fire prisms on the other side of the table that they can't do much about. Moving on to other units that I think are maybe just a little bit less outstanding, War Walkers are still one of the better ones I feel. Not a whole load to say about them, other than reasonably cheap and efficient heavy weapons of your choice, quite flexible firepower for depending on what you want to add, depends on whether or not you want the slight extra protection of the War Walker, or the fast move and quite cheap Viper. Wraith Lords and Wraith Seers are both solid enough, Wraith Lords are core so can get interesting buffs if you cluster them around characters. A bit of heavy weapon fire and some massive melee with Ghost Lairs when they get close. And it's kind of similar for the Wraith Seer, except you could usually pack a D cannon on that one. And then have massive D3 plus 3 melee if you can catch something. The Night Spinner gives you a bit of Ignore's line of sight shooting. I feel like it does pay a bit of a premium for it now, particularly since the Barrage nerf. Maybe D cannons are a bit better, seeing as their AP makes them a bit more resistant to it. We already mentioned the Crimson Hunter, an anti-tank flyer that your opponent is going to struggle to hide from. Pretty balanced for the points cost, I think. And maybe kind of similar with the Hemlock Wraith Fighter. 
Again, I really feel like it pays a premium for being a flyer and being able to get exactly where you need it to, but it does have some general purpose damage, plus the ability to do something like jinx an enemy unit. I'd say perhaps out of any of the Eldar vehicles, the most lacking in the Codex might be the Wraith Knight. The stat line's not awful, but I feel like the numbers just don't quite stack up for it. It's got the disadvantages of being a Titanic vehicle, and with its war gear options, you're going to compromise fairly hard on melee, defence or shooting, depending on what you pick. Probably a unit that just needs a fairly hefty points drop. Characters next, and as mentioned earlier, Farseers and Warlocks pretty much are the pick of the section. The Runes of Fate and the Runes of Fortune are both excellent, and most lists tend to run multiple Farseers. I feel like the foot version and the jet bike version are kind of balanced in terms of the extra utility and movement that you get. They're both fine, and Eldrad is great for Ulthwe. Warlocks are similarly excellent value as well. Protect and Jinx particularly, they don't take up force organisation slots as well if you have a Farseer, which you mostly will. And they can be an interesting choice for things like psychic actions as well, having a cheap unit to do mental interrogation. Then otherwise, out of the Phoenix Lords, Varroth gets included in quite a lot of competitive lists. He's the Phoenix Lord that can jump on and off the board. A typical turn for him might have him move out with his massive movement, shoot something with his souped up last blaster, charge something easy that he can kill, then redeploy himself back somewhere safe within your lines, or ready to do it again if the enemy puts something close. Having objectives secured can also mean that he can always just switch to being an annoying thing to kill on objectives as well, particularly with his Phoenix Lord protection against taking too many wounds. I feel like he's the best of the Phoenix Lords. Jane Zar and Karandras are maybe two of the other good ones, Karandras setting up close to the enemy and dealing a bunch of melee damage, Jane Zar being very fast and nicely fighting. Besides then, the Avatar of Cain can be an interesting big stompy threat to shove up the middle of the board. The majority of lists seem to pass him up, perhaps because despite the fact that he's tough, he is likely going to be tanking the vast majority of the enemy's anti-tank damage, as Eldar don't typically have a lot to distract from it. His combat stats are really good for the points cost, but he doesn't do an awful lot besides that. Could be nice to pair with Fortune, just to increase that durability to higher levels. Autarchs at the moment are very much second place to the Farseers. I feel like they're perhaps most interesting in Inari or maybe Same Han. Either the foot one with the jump generator and the Starglaive are nice, or potentially the jet bike one with the laser lance. Spirits here is basically a choice that you could use if you're running Wraith units. If you're running a trio of Wraith Lords or a big 10 man unit of Wraith Guard or Blades, then that's probably worth it for the rerolls, otherwise, probably just take a Farseer. For a Latoc, Illic Knight Spear is usable and he can deal damage with Strands of Fate. Quite a fun choice to use if you're taking them. And for the Inari, we'll get to in a second. Generally, the Incarn is absolutely excellent, if Rain and the Vizarch less so. Briefly touching on allies next, the Eldar do have their options. In general, I don't think it makes too much sense to be breaking your secondary objectives or Strands of Fate, but you can get some nice allies in a Harlequin patrol. Use their Travelling Players rule and you get to feel one detachment of them. It can be very worth it, as they're arguably one of the strongest armies in 40k right now. Most of their units and characters are good, though I'd say probably from an allied point of view, maybe troops in Star Weavers are perhaps the most use. Super fast moving and dangerous units that have objective secures that can venture forward to take objectives fairly comfortably. That could well be worth the 2cp cost of admission. Definitely by no means mandatory for Crashed Worlds, but I feel like they're very usable if you want to add them in. The Drukhari, on the other hand, I'd say are not worth breaking detachment rules for, and in particular their units really get loads of value out of their own power from pain, which you won't get as allies. Losing all the advances and charges is a bit sad. The other option to mix in Harlequins and Drukhari units, though, are the Inari. I have done an entire video about them, and I'll link that down in the video description. As mentioned, they're currently arguably the strongest way to play Eldar that isn't just Harlequins, and I've got great win rates in tournaments at around about 53% or so. If you choose to play Death Flavoured Eldar, then the Incarn is pretty much an auto include Tough to take down, Psychic Powers, a sword that ignores Invul saves and does D3 plus 3 damage, plus some really irritating teleport tricks to jump it across the board, potentially getting somewhere incredibly threatening, or running away from an enemy counter-attack. Definitely worth running if you're playing Inari. Otherwise, Inari do well with just about anything that's melee focused. Their buff gets you to hit harder if your squad's taking casualties, so infantry units are quite nice from that. But perhaps more importantly are their Revenant Discipline Psychic Powers. Literally all of them are great, I think. You get plus one to wound in melee, and unbind souls for auto wounds on sixes, plus some fun witch fires. You do pass up the runes of fate, which is no small thing. They basically lose that for a big melee damage boost trade-off. Out of Inari units, Harlequin troops with melee boosts are perhaps one of the best things to build around. 
take some rangers to unlock them, and then stack buffs on them, like the AP-1 Warlord trait, any of the melee craft world units that we've talked about, particularly striking scorpions and howling banshees, maybe shining spears, generic strong craft world things that work well regardless, dire avengers, D cannons, or swooping hawks. The Drukari units are maybe a little bit less interesting in my opinion, though Cabalite warriors can be cheap for objectives, witches can be interesting with melee, and the Void Raven bomber isn't bad as an allied flyer. Finally, I thought we'd take a quick look through a few competitive Eldar lists just to bring things together. These were a few that I featured in a previous video on Eldar the other week. First up is one example of an Ulthway list by Matt Shuckman, who used it to take second at Nova Open 2022. And it's two patrols of Psyker Heavy Goodness, the main incentive being to minimise troops and maximise HQs, it would seem. The list is led by Eldrad, who takes the Warlord traits to mess with Strands of Fate a bit. He's got Guide, Fortune, and Will of Azayan. And then he's backed up by a Farseer Skyrunner with Fateful Divergence for the CP, Doom and Ghost Walk for the extra plus 2 charge. The Farseer takes the Ghost Helm Relic for the guaranteed cast on a 9 plus, plus the extra power. There's then two individual Warlock Skyrunners, one with Protect and Jinx, one with Quicken and Restrain. Could be good for psychic actions as well. And then there's the Avatar of Kane, who I'm sure will be backed up by Fortune. Quite cool to see him being run. I guess in Ulthway he'd also get the 5 plus save against Mortal Wounds as well, even if he doesn't have Fortune up. Baharoth is here, he can jump on and off the board dealing damage as we mentioned. There's two units of rangers to fill out the troops and maybe do midfield actions if desired. There's two units of dire avengers which I guess will be riding in the falcons, potentially dropping down for an alpha strike with shuriken if it made sense. There's two units of howling banshees, both of which take mirror swords, one takes piercing strikes for extra damage and one nerf shredding shriek for mortal wounds when they charge. Two units of swooping hawks that can jump on and off the board putting out anti-infantry damage all game long, and stay hidden. There's three scary falcons that can drop down turn one with the drop pod star special rules. Besides the pulse laser, they've got a scatter laser and shuriken catapults. One of them has a shuriken cannon instead. And finally, to round off the list, there's a viper with the bright lance and shuriken catapults. Could be interesting enough to be an expendable threat on objectives, and it'll certainly like the V-roll wound roll from Orthway. Pretty cool to see a list that's very psycho heavy and then an avatar backed up by some falcon tanks alongside plenty of the normal strong aspect warrior stuff. Next up we've got a strong hail of doom list, this one by Ryan Olsen who used it to take third at mid Missouri maelstrom. Hail of doom's all about packing in loads of shuriken weapons and it certainly does that. This one's made out of a patrol and vanguard detachment. Again we're starting the list with a couple of farseers, one takes fateful divergence and guide. Guy being very nice to trigger those extra sixes, and one having Doom and Will of Azayan, and the combo with the Mark of the Incomparable Hunter and Kornus's bow. There's two small conclaves of Warlocks, one with two Warlocks with Quicken and Restrain, and one with a Jetseer Council with two with Jinx and Protects, and again Barahoth jumping on and off the board. Then for squads, there's just the one unit of Rangers to fill out the patrol troops, and then again, interestingly, this is another very Falcon heavy list. Three Falcon Grav Tanks dropping out of the sky turn 1 with double Shuriken Cannons, so plenty of Shuriken goodness there, and lightly disgorging the three units of six Dire Avengers with the extra Shuriken Catapults, so even more Auto Wound 6s going through there. That's quite a nasty Alpha Strike, could certainly ruin one area of the table, and might combo nicely with the Farseer Skyrunner with Doom. But then it is a fair bit of melee, again two units of Howling Banshees with Mirror Swords, this time one with Piercing Strikes, and one with Nerve Shedding Shriek and Crone Scream. A Striking Scorpion unit with Biting Blade and Crushing Blows. Two units of five Wind Riders, four yet more scary Shurikens. One of them takes Shuriken Cannons rather than Catapults. Three Shining Spears with the Paracan Saber, Heart Strike, Kane's Lance and Shuriken Cannon. Very elite there. And finally one Viper with unsurprisingly two Shuriken Cannons. This list just seems to be all about massive damage. The first turn damage output on this is pretty crazy if the opponent leaves important things open. Most of the units move very fast and can just pour out a hideous amount of high AP shuriken death on whatever they need to. Pretty scary stuff, I'm sure it'll be a blast to play when it's working well. Finally we've got one example of a strong Inari list at the moment. This one by Ben Jones who used it to take second at the Hertfordshire GT. This one's built around a single battalion with the Incarn in pride of place. Otherwise there's a Farseer with Fateful Divergence for CP, and Unbind Souls for extra auto wounding on 6s, which could also be backed up by some of the Warlocks casting Ancestor's Grace for the plus 1 to wound as well. The Farseer's got the Ambush of Blades Warlord trait for an extra pip of AP, 
That's be really nice on the Harlequin troops that have kind of middling AP on their minus two weapons. There's then an Autark with a Starglaive, Fusion Gun, Banshee Mask, and Fulture's Wing. He can make an enemy unit fight last with that Banshee Mask, plus provide some rerolls as well. And there's also a Warlock Skyrunner with Protect and Jinx, which he can take slot free. In the troop slot, there's two units of Rangers to start on the midfield objectives, and they unlock two units of Harlequins, maximally loaded up with all the melee stuff. Five Harlequins Kisses, two Caresses, and two Embraces, so you could use any of their Mortal Wound type stratagems to pretty devastating effect there. With the amount of buffs that you can get from the characters, these will be brutal to just about anything that they charge at, all the way up to big units of Terminators and Knights. Then to fill out the rest of the army, there's again two units of Howling Banshees, two with Mirror Swords again, and again Piercing Strikes and Crone Stream, the Striking Scorpions unit with Crushing Blows and Biting Blade, three Skyweavers, one unit of six Swooping Hawks with the Phoenix Plume, and then interestingly enough some heavy firepower with two units of three support weapons with the D-Cannons, a very scary threat to be venturing in to 24 inch range, and should hopefully slam enemy units off those midfield objectives. Seems like a pretty awesome way to do fighty Eldar to be honest, I'm sure it'll be a good time whenever those Harlequin units wind up hitting home. So anyway, I think we'll leave that there for an overview of Craftworld Eldar in 40k 9th edition. As always, let me know what you make of the faction, and any particular combos and strategies that have been working for you, and of course anything else that I might have glossed over in this video that might also help out. As mentioned, I also have made a counterpart video to this focused around the Inari. I'll link that one down in the video description if you are interested in checking it out. They do seem to be one of the strongest ways to play Eldar at the moment. Otherwise, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly have more like this in the future. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that links down in the video description as well if you're interested. The channel's Patreon page is what allows me to keep these videos coming like this. It does take an awful lot of time and effort to make these big faction review style ones. If you have been finding them useful, any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.